So, uh, so our actually first speaker, I should say, is Jose Luis Martí. Um, um, I'm not going to introduce you specifically, so you just maybe say whatever needs to be said about okay. you. Uh, there are two things uh, I want to tell you before Jose starts. First of all, uh, uh, there appears to have been uh, come up an emergency situation because of lack of coffee. There will be some coffee available over here in a moment, but we will not make any break. So if you really need to have coffee, you can, you know, get out and, and get a, a cup later on. Uh, the second thing is uh, the internet access. We do have an internet access in this room, but I think we will simply post it on the Facebook event page, right? So everybody will be able to get it from there. So, Jose. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Martí, and I come from Barcelona, from Pompeu Fabra University. Uh, I teach in the law school. Uh, what I do is mostly democratic theory. That's my field. I'm, I happen to be vice rector of innovation right now, but uh, basically I've been studying um, different processes of participatory and deliberative democracy uh, for all my life. That's what I've been doing. Um, and today I, I would like to uh, share with you some of my concerns, some of my ideas about uh, how I think we should reconceptualize uh, the idea of constitution making. So 200, more than 200 years after the first experiences of modern constitutionalism, uh, by the end of the 18th century, I think that uh, the time come up to um, reconceptualize, discuss, review the way in which we uh, decide, make decisions about our constitutions, and innovate and experiment about all this. Um, so the idea I want to present, um, I call it crowd constitution making. This connects with a concept I will explain briefly later on, uh, which is the concept of crowd law. Um, you will hear more about crowd law later on because Beth Novick, who is probably the mother of this idea of crowd law, uh, will explain it on herself uh, uh, later on this morning or today. Uh, but in any case, this idea of cr crowd constitution making uh, should sound quite familiar to all of you because, of course, uh, it connects strongly with this idea of crowdsourced constitution that uh, Iceland has been uh, innovating. Um, so first of all, I think Iceland, um, it's not a surprise if I tell you that Iceland has been leading the way. Uh, Katrin Oddsdottir was, I think, too modest when she said that you always follow what others do, right? Well, she mentioned you know, that you had your, the first prime minister, women prime minister, and also that you had the oldest parliament. It's not too bad, right? So you have two very remarkable uh, 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 events or, or uh, facts in your past that were quite innova innovative and quite important on that time. But I think that uh, what happened here in the years 2008, 2012, and 2013 is also quite remarkable. And I will start actually uh, saying a few words about this. Um, I think missing some of the slides, maybe, but, okay. Um, so, I will go quickly here. I don't need to remember, to remind you what happened in 2008, uh, the, you know, the collapse of the financial and economic markets all around the world, and the outrage that many people had uh, in many countries. Um, you remember Iceland was the first country in which you could find protests that year. It was in early 2008. Many people were outraged. They took the streets. They went to protest in front of the parliament. Um, and they couldn't believe what Catherine, as Catherine expressed quite well, they couldn't believe what was going on. Uh, they had an enormous sense of outrage and uh, indignation. Um, they were totally, totally uh, uh, disappointed with the political uh, parties and with their government and with the political and representative institutions. That was not, actually, to be honest, that was not the first time 
in contemporary times in the recent years in which you can see a country protesting that massively and that aggressively. Uh, many people point out to the case of Argentina, 2001, you may remember that Argentina went to a default. They couldn't afford to pay their national debt anymore in 2001, and the government took all sort of controversial de decisions, and the people, again, were outraged. They went to the streets. They were protesting massively against the decisions of the government. What was the center of these mobilizations in Argentina was, again, a very familiar story to many of us, the idea that politicians are not representing us well, that we cannot trust the system anymore, that our representative institutions are not working. And of course, after Iceland, there are so many examples that come to our mind exactly in the same direction. We have the Arab Spring, right? Tunisia was the first in December 2010. And again, you know, Tunisia was not a democracy, but the people were outraged with the way in which the government had been managing the crisis. And of course, very quickly, you had Tahrir Square. That was like a symbol, right? That was very important for many people in many other countries. Thousands of people gathering in Tahrir Square in Egypt um, for days, for weeks, right, protesting and resisting police aggressions and so on and so forth. Um, the importance of Tahrir and Egypt and the Arab Spring in general for the other movements that came later, later has been studied for many people, right? And we can say that, for instance, in Madrid, which was Madrid and Barcelona and other Spanish cities, was one of the earlier uh, mobilizations that wa were deeply influenced by the Arab Spring and uh, uh, by the Icelandic protests uh, two years before. And again, what happened here, you can s always find the same pattern, right? So massive mobilizations, people protesting. They don't feel represented. The, m the central motto in these mobilizations in Spain was they referring to politicians, they do not represent us. That's Madrid, May 2011, the so-called 15M movement. 15M is 15 May, May 15th, uh, also called the Indignados movement, right? Um, the outraged movement. Uh, and again, they took the square, they stayed there for weeks, and they tried to change the system uh, entirely. The same happened in Barcelona. And Missing some titles here, but anyway. And the same could be seen later on, on on Occupy Wall Street movement in many other cities in the States, uh, the same year, 2011, or two years later in Turkey. Here, the mobilizations, the protests started around a particular decision made, an urban decision made about a, a park, the Gezi Park. And again, you see thousands of people mobilizing and protesting against the government. The same happened in Taiwan, 2014, with the students' movement. The Hong Kong, later on that year, the so-called Umbrella Revolution. Um, the same pattern can be seen in Brazil, 2015 and 16. Again, thousands of people protesting against the impeachment of the president. And many other protests in the United States, just to name a few of them, protests against the way in which we are managing climate change, anti-Trump's protests, women protests, and many other mobilizations that are uh, fueled by the same kind of concerns. But again, so my point is Iceland is a special. And why so? Well, because you managed to do something that is really remarkable, really outstanding. Out of this outrage, out of this, you know, in a way, aggressivity and hi, Beth, uh, and uh, indignation and you know uh, disappointment, etc. Out, out of all these negative uh, attitudes and reactions, you managed to produce something that was looking ahead, that was constructive, that was positive, that was trying to rebuild social trust and was trying to build some something new, right? A new system, and then. Spontaneously, or quite spontaneously, you organize these national assemblies, 2009, 2010, and finally you get, you got into the process of naming, electing the members of the Constitutional Assembly, then you fought with the Constitutional Court, finally the Parliament appointed the Constitutional Council. I will not go into the details here because you all know the, this story much better than I do. But that's very remarkable, right? So that was probably the first case in history, the, face, the first time in which a constitutional process, a constituent process, was run so openly, spontaneously, and 
um, open to the collaboration and participation of the people. It was actually, we might claim, a bottom-up process. That was really remarkable. And I don't want to forget also this part. You also welcomed all sort of suggestions, proposals, ideas, etc., through Facebook, uh, and you gathered thousands of comments and proposals. Um, you know, many people complain about the quality of these proposals or how way they were managed. It doesn't matter. You were experimenting on that. That was the first time that you were that someone was doing this, and I think this is to be welcome. I think that's a very, very important thing. Uh, no matter how successful it was, I know you know the end of the story was, for a while, was a little failure, but uh, I think it's absolutely good news that you are restarting uh, the process and reviewing, again, the constitutional amendment process. Um, so I think we can fairly say, fairly describe the Icelandic experiment as the first experiment in, in what I call crowd constitution making. It's not the only one, right? So it was the first, but it's not the only one. Later, there were other processes going on in different corners of the world. Uh, we will learn more about the Irish case in a minute with the Constitutional Convention 2012-2014. There, was, there has been also a remarkable, not fully successful, but remarkable process going on in Chile, the Asamblea Constituyente from 2015. There has been a successful, quite successful process in Mexico City, la Asamblea Constituyente de la Ciudad de México. There are many other processes that in one way or another got inspired by the Icelandic case. They look very differently. They didn't follow exactly the same path but they got inspired by this idea of opening up constituent processes to the participation of the people. We might actually ask who's next, right? So we, I expect this list to grow and grow in the future. Some people talk about Catalonia. Um, actually, we were talking about this before. Uh, Catalan independentists, uh, maybe too optimistically, they were interested in learning about the Icelandic case, the Irish case, and other precedents, basically to try to plan and design their own constituent process in the case that they could manage to get independence. As you know, they haven't managed so far to get independent, but if they do, um, the, leaders, the leaders of the process are committed also to this idea of having an open constituent process. So what is crowd constitution making? Um, when I talk about crowd constitution making, basically what I mean is uh, a part of a wider concept, a wider idea that we might call crowd law. Crowd law, I invite you actually to check and learn more in the crowd law's website, crowd.law. Uh, but as I announced uh, before, we will hear more about it uh, in the intervention by Beth Nobeck, uh, who is probably the mother of the crowd law movement, in a way. Um, so she will explain us better what crowd law is and what crowd law aims at, etc. But so we might just give this uh, initial uh, definition. Crowd law is the simple but powerful idea that parliaments, governments, and public institutions in general work better, maybe much better, when they boost citizen engagement leveraging new technologies to tap into diverse sources of information, judgments, and expertise at each stage of the law and policymaking cycle to improve the quality as well as the legitimacy of the resulting laws and policies. That's, in a nutshell, the idea of crowd law. And of course, crowd law can come, as I said, it applies to different institutions at different levels. So crowd law can come from the highest level, which is actually constitution making, right? Uh, and then we might be calling here about crowd constitution making. Uh, but it, calls, it can also apply to crowd law making in legislatures. It can apply to crowd policy making in regulatory agencies, or crowd adjudication in courts, or crowd execution in the executive and public administration, and so on and so forth. So crowd law is a very general process, uh, uh, concept that applies to very different levels, to very different uh, stages of the lawmaking and policy making cycle. And again, we will learn more about it uh, in a minute, in a few minutes. So what makes crowd law special, to my view, is the use of technology, first, and citizen engagement, second, that's the second element, and participation. But what is crucial is that this use of technology and this citizen engagement focuses, it aims at the improving of quality, 
of the quality of the results of public decision making. It's not just participation for the sake of participation. It's participation oriented to create better laws and better decisions. It's not direct democracy, but it's not representative democracy either. It's a combination of both. Representative democracy, but opened up to the citizen collaboration and deliberation, and finally to collective intelligence. Um, so now let me get a step back. Um, as I said, modern constitutionalism, uh, as you all know, uh, it was originated in the United States, in the formation of the United States by the end of the 18th century. Um, from then on, onwards, to up to just a few years ago, constitutionalism has been, in my view, a top-down issue, a top-down business. Um, we can just think in the historical examples, you know, the Philadelphia Convention, 18, 1787, or in the Constituent Assembly in France, 1789, and any other example that you might have in mind. For modern constitutionalism, I think that the following five features are crucial. First, constitutions are adopted by constitutional assemblies or conventions whose members typically come from the elite. Usually professional politicians or notables or you know, famous people or professors, academics, etc. But they come from the elite, right? Um, Sometimes these members are democratic, democratically elected, and I will refer to these later, but not in every case. But even if they are, they are conceived to be totally independent from the people, right? They, there's no mandate, they cannot receive instructions, they cannot receive indications about what they should do, the people cannot prioritize topics or issues, the people are not, in principle, able to say what they should be discussing about. They are not even responsible for the agenda. So they are conceived to be totally independent. And, and that's also very important, the liberation in these constitutional assemblies and, con and conventions is supposed to be run uh, behind closed doors, right? So, and, you know, there are many reasons actually to do that because you don't want to people just to, you know, show off and speak, you know, use rhetoric just to impress the people and so on. So you want a genuine deliberation occurring there, but the result of that is that then these deliberations are, again, occurring behind closed doors, and the people simply ignore what they are discussing. Fourth feature is that the framers or drafters, those who are responsible for writing the draft and the exact, the concrete text, they are usually a smaller group, sometimes commissioned by the assembly or the convention, but they are not accountable or if they are, they are just accountable to the assembly, but never to the people directly. And again, you know, they are supposed to be quite isolated from social pressures, political pressures, and political input from the people. And finally, and most importantly for me, uh, in modern classic constitutionalism, you can find two moments of popular participation, at best, right? So in the best case scenario, you can find two moments of political, uh, sorry, popular participation. First, sometimes, you don't need to have them, actually. Many processes, you, you have none, right? In some other processes, you find one of them. But in the best case uh, scenarios, you have two processes or two moments of uh, citizen participation. One is what I call the previous act of authorization that usually uh, uh, happens when the people elect the members of the assembly. Right? In some cases, the members of the Constitutional Assembly have been elected democratically. Um, but again, as I said, this election comes with no mandate, no concrete instructions. They are not allowed to say to send any message to the members of the Assembly. It's just a blind check, right? So it's just blind trust, uh, this act of authorization. Second, in some occasions, there is an exposed ratification process uh, that usually comes uh, through the process of a referendum. And that's the second and final uh, form of input of po popular participation. Again, you don't find this referendum in all processes in history, right? If you look back at the processes of modern constitutionalism, it's quite, actually, it's quite a recent innovation, right? To have this kind of referendum as an exposed ratification. I think we can say, we should not be, you know, 
too pessimistic or catastrophic. I think modern constitutionalism has been a success. That's my positive um, opinion about it, right? It has been quite a success. Modern constitutionalist standards, including these two moments of popular participation, have worked very well, I think, if we look back in history. But I think that today, the standards, the democratic standards that come with it are too low, right? So I think that we are in the 21st century, and for the reasons I will uh, immediately explain, I think that we should demand much more from our 21st century constitution-making processes. Let me focus concretely, and I will go quickly through it, but we can come back in the Q&A if you want. I see basically three problems in the modern constitutionalist idea. Um, when we see it from today, right, again, I think that historically it worked quite well and it was quite good. You know, if I look at my own history in Spain, our constitution was uh, passed and was approved by a referendum, was ratified in 1978. Uh, we had the two uh, moments of popular participation that I previously mentioned, and I think that was quite enough for that time. All what I want to say is that this is not enough anymore, right? We need to make a step farther. So first of all, the first problem, I think there is insufficient democratic control over the input to the process. Uh, that's what I call the blank check problem, right? So if you look at these two moments of popular participation, basically, as I said, in the best case scenario, what you have is that the people elect the members of the Constitutional Assembly. That's fine, you know. But the problem is that no mandate is allowed, no concrete instructions, there's no previous deliberation because there's no point in deliberating anything since the people are not allowed to send any message, any instruction to the members of the assembly. So all what the people do here is just, you know, again, blindly choose or select some representatives to make some decisions on their behalf, on their name, um, but without having any other possibility of uh, giving any input. Uh, I think that is insufficient today. Second, what I call the black box problem. The, I think democratic control is also insufficient during the process, right, when the process is ongoing. I think uh, typically these constituent processes, as I said, they run behind closed doors. They are not totally transparent. The members, the people who are participating in the process, they are not really accountable to the people. They are not explaining. They are not justifying what they are discussing. Uh, I know, I mean, there are at least Catherine Odd's daughter, maybe some other member of the Constitutional Council uh, in Iceland is present here. And, and I know you might be thinking, what do you want? You want us to explain every day what we are talking? That would be probably a nightmare. And that's not what I'm advocating, of course. But, but I think we can make lots of improvement in the way in which these processes are run, especially, and that's a crucial part, to benefit from the input of the people, right? That's the main idea in the crowd law uh, ideal that I will elaborate a little bit later. Finally, we have the all or nothing problem. When we come to this second part of popular participation in modern constitutionalism, in traditional constitutionalism, uh, in the best case scenarios, when you have the people having uh, uh, the right to vote in a referendum, to accept or reject, ratify or reject the constitutional draft, all what they have is just the possibility of have, having this all or nothing choice, right? Either they ratify the whole text or they reject it all the way through. I know that's not the way in which you run your referendum here. I think, again, that is an interesting innovation that you came uh, with here in the process by you know, segregating several questions and allowing the people to have separate votes on each of these issues. I think that's absolutely interesting. But again, that's not the normal case. The normal case is that the people just vote yes or no, and that means that they cannot reject specific parts of the Constitution that maybe they are not fully happy with. And of course, they cannot rewrite or change the terms in which some of these clauses have been uh, drawn. They cannot prioritize different, the, the different elements elements of the Constitution, etc., etc. So I think these ratification processes, the traditional ones, are again insufficient for the standards of democracy in the 21st century. Opposed to this modern, classic, traditional idea of crowd, con uh, sorry, of constitution making, which is, as I tried to explain, a top-down idea, I think we can rely more and more on new ways to approach this uh, uh, 
business. And one of them, one of the most promising, is what I or we call crowd constitution making, which is rather a bottom-up or maybe mixed constitutionalism. It's not exactly bottom-up. I think that the Icelandic case was a rather bottom-up process um, with you know, good uh, uh, features and maybe not so good features. But, but crowd law or crowd constitution making is more interested about mixing up different elements and combining different elements. Some of them certainly need to be much more bottom-up. OK, I, I find, again, some slides are missing. But um, I find two, basically two reasons why we should move from uh, traditional constitutionalism to crowd, what I call crowd constitution making. First, we have a reason, a strong reason of legitimacy. Constitutions cannot be seen as top-down impositions anymore. I think that is what um, draws from the basic, fundamental democratic principle that all those affected by a public decision should have an equal say in the decision-making process. You know, many people might attempt to say that classic constitutionalism, in a way, was compatible with this democratic principle. At the very least, the people could have a say, at least in some cases, in those in which there was a ratification process with a referendum, they could have an equal say in voting in that referendum. But again, I think today that is not enough. I think that we should make huge improvement, huge progress in the way in which we understand this idea of having an equal say. Um, I think the people need more effective means of control. As I said, I, I see fundamental failures in this idea that the people should have the ultimate control over the system and over the decisions that apply to them. And I see these failures at these three levels, over the inputs to the constitutional process, over the process uh, of constitutional amendment or constituent process itself, and over the results. But the second reason, and also fundamental for the ideal of crowd law, is that by engaging the people, by inviting the people to collaborate and um, bring new ideas, bring uh, new sources of information, new their uh, bring their judgments and their sources of expertise, we can have a fundamental and remarkable impact in the quality of the decisions that are being made. I think that we now more, much more, we don't know everything, but we know much more about how collective intelligence works. And I think that this idea of crowd constitution making is fundamentally connected, fundamentally grounded on these uh, mechanisms of con collective intelligence. The decisions that we have to make today, uh, together, starting with the constitution, constitutional decisions, will be much better if we design uh, the processes of constitutional review in a way that is open to this popular participation. Uh, you should have a title here. I'm missing some titles uh, in the slides. I'm sorry about this. Uh, so this image was meant to represent the idea of collective intelligence. And I as I was saying, we know much more today about how it works. We are identifying the exact processes by which collective intelligence can bring better results. Uh, there's a lot of things that we need to learn more. Um, so we are actually at, a, at an early stage in our understanding of how it works, but we have made fundamental progress in the very last years. So the underlying intuition here is that when we design these processes correctly in the right conditions, we can, as I said, uh, bring better decisions, better quality in the decisions we make together. This is based on something that I will not elaborate here. Let me just mention it uh, quickly. But this is based on what I take to be three cognitive powers of big groups. The power of aggregation that works on itself separately from the other two. The power of deliberation, which is crucial. right? So when, whenever we talk about inviting people to participate and engage in public decision making, the way to do it is basically by designing a process of genuine deliberation that's absolutely crucial, and the power of adaptation. Um, as I said, I will not elaborate on this. Oh. Um, OK. What is supposed to be here is the idea that what is new um, in this uh, approach, in this way to approach things, is not only the idea of collective intelligence and the conviction that we can um, 
make better decisions, as I said, if we use these kind of processes, but also that we can use the new technologies in our health. And here, again, we are making huge progress, right? So the new technologies uh, in different levels, mm, gosh, um, let's see what I can do. You know, John, do you have another PowerPoint here? No, that's all what we have, okay. Um, let me just, sorry. Um, No, I have it here. Thank you. Um, that's actually a nice way to tell me that I should uh, speak shorter. Uh, doesn't matter. I can I can skip some content. But um, so let me before getting to this third part of my talk. So basically, I, I was finishing the second part in which I was explaining this idea of cr crowd constitution making. And I, as I was saying, what is crucial, again, if you remember the definition I gave you, what is crucial uh, for crowd, crowd law and for crowd constitution making is the use of new technologies. I think we can make, we can experiment, we can innovate here a lot. And there are many technologies that are, can be of, of help here uh, from social media, and mobile technology and big data analysis, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and you know all the technologies that are now fashionable and probably new technologies that we will learn about uh, in a few years. So again, these new technologies can help us to design processes of constitution making that are open up to citizens' engagement and participation with the aim of improving the results. That's a key idea I, want, I wanted you uh, to keep in mind. The conclusion, as I said already, uh, should not be that we know everything, that we know all the responses. So I'm not here actually to give you any definite or close response to the challenges that we face. I think what we, most of us or many of us can share is the conviction that the traditional forms of decision making are no longer working well. I think that's part, maybe not the entire of it, not, not all of it, but it's part of what triggers the citizens' participation and citizens' protests in the uh, years uh, 2008 and onwards that, we, that I started mentioning. Um, I think that this dissatisfaction, this disappointment, and this outrage in some cases with the way in which the system is working is what should trigger as academics, as practitioners, as politicians, which should trigger our uh, quest for finding new responses. And I'm here basically advocating some ways to think about this finding of new responses, but I'm not uh, bringing to you or providing any you know, definitive or closed uh, proposal. So I think the main conclusion I want to draw from the second part before going to my third and final point is that we need to experiment. Right? So I think that's a conclusion that we should all uh, agree with. And if you don't, I'm happy also to discuss with you in the Q&A why you don't. So um, the third point I wanted to make concerns another element that we should take into account. I think the Icelandic case has been a, a fantastic model, a fantastic inspiration for this second um, concept, or the second element of my talk, the idea of crowd constitution making. And I will come back to this by the end of the talk uh, briefly. Um, but I think there has been something missing, to my view, in the Icelandic process of 2008 and 2011 and, and 12. A missing point, a missing feature, or at least let me put it that way, I think there's something that we should take into account more and more here in Iceland and in other countries in other parts of the world. And that's the idea that whenever we are making new constitutions or reviewing the old constitutions now in our democracies, we should take into account fundamentally as a 
point of departure, as part of the world in which we live, that we are living in a globalized and digitalized world. We are not anymore isolated, right? That's why I had this, uh, that, this uh, uh, drawing, right? So this is like the image, the typical image of the Westphalian global order. The world is composed of different countries, each of them with its own flag, with its own constitution, with its own legal order. They may collaborate with each other or they may fight with each other, but each of them is sovereign, right? So that's the main principle for the Westphalian global order that has characterized our political world for two centuries. So it's not surprising that back in by the end of the 18th century when the United States got independent from the UK, from Great Britain, and uh, innovated for the first time in a modern way of making constitutions, it's not surprising that they, the first thing they thought is that they were in need of elaborating a constitution for themselves, for the people, right? We the people. By we the people, what they meant is we the Americans or the citizens of the United States uh, who are now independent and need to make decisions on our own for our own, right? Democracy, the government of the people, for the people, and by the people. This pretty much fits with this image of the world, right? So we have discrete, separated, is relatively isolated, or at least independent, on a formal basis, countries, each of them with its own flag. You know, the world as a mere aggregation of countries. But I think that's not anymore the world in which we live, right? So we live nowadays, and you all know that, we live in a world in which everything is interconnected, and everything is interdependent. So when one country makes a decision, uh, let's say an economic decision, we all know, especially if it's United States or China or one of the big countries, we all know that that has immediate effects on the rest of the world. Actually, you don't need to be the United States to have these effects. You can be Greece, and Greece can also make decisions that can have important uh, influ uh, influence or impact on the situation of other countries. So we, need, we now need to reconceptualize our politics and also our constitution making to take this into account, to um, assume that we live in a different, totally different world. Uh, let me just very quickly, um, in my last eight minutes, let me very quickly give you just a few examples. I will go very fast here. Give you a few examples of how different our world is. Here you probably don't see. Uh, the names, but here you have a list of the biggest economies in the world. In black, you have countries. In red, you have corporations. So Spain is the 10th biggest economy in the world, just before Australia, which is the 11th. But the 12th is not a country. It's Walmart, right? Um, and the uh, 13th is Sinopec, and the 14th is Royal Dutch Shell. And as you can see, many global corporations are much bigger than you know, most of the countries of the world. That tells us something about the power that these global corporations are concentrating. They, of course, are global. They operate all around the world. They don't care about specific regulations in one country or another. From the point of view of these companies, if Iceland comes with a constitution that is not exactly what they were expecting, that's just a little complication. If they can, they will go through it. They will do whatever they can to try to change it. And if they cannot change it, they probably wouldn't care, will not care. So that's the kind of world in which we live today, and we have to take this into account. And of course, we have, as I said, I will mention several examples that we all know, right? We need global regulations of the financial sector, which is also global. We need to do something about offshore countries. That's crucial and urgent if we want to keep some fiscality, which is, again, necessary to keep alive our welfare programs or any other policy we want to take. We have a huge climate change problem, and we are not doing very well in coordinating. So if this kind of Westphalian idea in which different countries come to cooperate with the hope, in the best case scenario, with the hope of um, dealing together with some common problems, has proven to fail in cases like climate change because we have had several summits, international summits, with very uh, tiny results, and we are actually going backwards. 
We have global ecology challenges, right? The preservation of ecosystems or the protection of endangered species. Or we need desperately and urgently to do something about extreme poverty, which is, of course, we know is triggering immigration and is triggering uh, inequality and is triggering cases of domination all over, over the world in, in degrees that we cannot afford anymore. And we have also global challenges of global health and the risk of pandemics and doctors tell us that it's just a matter of time, that we will face a lethal pandemic that will kill many people around the world. And this is, of course, a common problem that we should all work together to uh, deal with. We have the risk of natural catastrophes, and uh, we have concerns on nuclear security to prevent nuclear accidents, but also to keep under control nuclear weapons. We have global terrorism and global crime. We have you know, the risk of unregulated private military companies, which is not very as much well known as the others, but it's also a really serious problem in the world. We have, of course, of course problems of digital 